good it is to be home. When I landed in uh, Washington early um, Monday morning, it was three degrees. <laughs> so, uh, this is nice. It's really wonderful to be home. And away from uh, the, um, the hill right now, uh, especially with what's taking place, of course, with the Tea Party and with all of those who are really trying to prevent progress. And I'll just start by talking about what took place this week, and then we'll open for Q&A. But let me say how pleased I am to see so many of you. You can't hear how pleased I am. Can you hear me now? Is this on? Yeah. To um, see so many of you out on a Saturday morning. Uh, town meetings are so important for me. Uh, to, to connect with you, to let you know what's taking place, but also to hear from you. Many of my um, legislative ideas and agenda, they come from people in my district. And so this is a very important morning for me, and I want to uh, just salute you and thank you for coming out. You could be doing a lot of other things today, but you're here, and I really, really appreciate that. This week, you may have been following, and I don't know if the press really picked up much of it out here, but this was the week of the 50th anniversary of President Johnson's State of the Union speech, January 8, 1964. When he, uh, and I wish I had some quotes from that speech, but he laid out what he thought a war on poverty needed to look like and why. President Johnson laid out and I, and I just have to say, it was really very visionary of him because he had been raised in, in a very poor family. And so he got it, not only intellectually, but personally. President Johnson laid out this war on poverty and what resulted, and, and I reminded people this week of what resulted as, as his leadership took hold on this. We had Head Start, Medicaid, the Child Nutrition Act, food stamps. When you look at all of the, the Higher Ed Act, all of the major, major, not only safety net structures of our government, but major programs and policies that were put into place to lift people out of poverty into the middle class, that took place as a result of President Johnson's initiatives with the War on Poverty. Fast forward to 2014, these are many of the policies and programs now that are under assault. And so this week, what I wanted to do, and it was very, very powerful, we invited, um, and I chair the WHIPS Task Force on Poverty, Inequality, and Opportunity. And so we invited Linda Johnson Robb to Capitol Hill, the eldest daughter of Lady Bird and Lyndon Johnson. And she came to Capitol Hill, and we had a press conference, and she came to the gallery. And we talked about her father and her mother, and what the country was like during that day, and why this war on poverty, first of all, is succeeding. It has not been won yet, but why it's succeeding, and why we need to redouble our efforts to make sure that we win this war on poverty. She talked about the fact that this was a bipartisan effort and bicameral. Democrats and Republicans, House and Senate, which really embraced this. She reminded us that in 1964, the poverty rates were somewhere around 27%, and they're down now to 16%, still way too high in the richest and the most powerful country in the world. I mean, we still have, and one of the universities did a study, I think it was University of Michigan, that was reported in the New York Times this week. There are over a million and a half people living when you're talking about just cash payments, cash in hand, aside from food stamps and Medicaid and what have you, that there are 1.4 and 1.5 million people living on $2 a day in America. $2 a day, and that's comparable to many developing countries. And, and so we highlighted that and talked about how far we've come but how far we need to go and what we must do. And so immediately, what we need to do and what's taking place now, and maybe you're following this, is the big fight now around the extension of unemployment compensation, emergency unemployment compensation. And why is this important? Well, we worked and negotiated a budget 
before the end of the year. I couldn't vote for that. I mean, I'm glad this was passed. First of all, it was much too low and did not handle sequester the way it should have. But secondly, it, didn't, it left 1.4 million people out in the cold. <coughs> this week, people who were relying on unemployment compensation, emergency unemployment compensation, as they continue to look for a job, and the 95% of people who are on unemployment or want to work, they didn't get their checks this week. And so I couldn't vote for it. I didn't vote for it, and I led the effort in Congress with over 100 members to say, look, we need to get this done and get it done fast. So what's happening this week is, what happened this week is it did not get done. Now, what is taking place in the Senate is that they're trying to say, we want strings attached. In other words, maybe we want to cut food stamps some more, or we want to cut Medicaid to pay for unemployment. Now this is mean-spirited and it's wrong. Very seldom have we, in an emergency program, the strings attached, the pay-fors as we call them, that, that is not appropriate because it's an emergency. And so now people who are relying on unemployment compensation, the most vulnerable people living on the edge, on the brink, they're being used as, and I say as pawns in this political game. The speaker in, in the House has said he's not going to let it come up unless we cut somewhere. And so it's kind of, they want to rob Peter to pay Paul. And, and for me, this is morally wrong and it's economically stupid because unemployment benefits bring, I, I believe it's 300, 400,000 jobs that um, are being lost now as a result of it ending. Plus, consumer spending rise, there are many economic benefits for uh, people to receive their unemployment compensation. So I don't know what's going to happen next week. We um, are still looking to the Senate to figure out what they're going to do. You know, I hope they do something that we could support in the House, but I also hope that Speaker Boehner brings up a bill, a freestanding bill that says, look, at least for three months, let's cover and provide the unemployment benefits for the 1.4 million people. And you know, each and every week, this number is growing. More people are going to continue to lose their unemployment compensation. And so it's really critical that we do this and do this very quickly. So stay tuned, but keep the phone calls. You know, I'm hearing from a lot of you. And thank you for communicating with me because my district, I still say, is the most enlightened and the most um, diverse and the most progressive and the most eager congressional district in the country. And you all are really very aware of what's taking place. So keep communicating with me and others about what you think we need to do. <coughs> Finally, let me just say, uh, raising the minimum wage, that's another part of our strategy to make sure that we address income inequality, which we must do. Raising the minimum wage, well, here in California is a bit higher, but still, we need a living wage. I mean, even raising it to $10.10 .10 nationally, I mean, what is that? We need a living wage. And so while I'm going to continue to fight to raise the minimum wage, there's some of us who are saying we've got to get to a living wage. <coughs> and that is how we begin to help people get into the middle class and get out of the ranks of the working poor. There are 50 to 60 percent of people, low wage workers, the working poor, they're eligible for food stamps and Medicaid. I mean, can you believe this? We are, your tax dollars are subsidizing these big corporations. Many of them tell their employees, go apply for food stamps, go apply for Medicaid. You know who I'm talking about. These are bad you know who I'm talking about. And so your tax dollars are paying these corporations to pay low wages so their employees can benefit from the safety of How cruel is that? And that's what's happening in our own country. And so we have a lot of work to do. I'd like to just uh, recognize Mayor, Mayor Cassidy and just thank you for your tremendous leadership here in San Leandro. So San Leandro and Vice Mayor uh, Jim Prola and Diana, I don't know, where's Diana? Hi Jim, hi Diana, thank you so much. You know, San Leandro, I just have to say, in my district really is a shining light because your elected officials, all of you and your leadership, your nonprofits, your chamber, your business community, everyone seems to really want to make sure that this community 
creates jobs and provides for economic opportunity, housing, clean energy, all of the um, fiber optics that are so essential to the 21st, I mean 21st century in terms of uh, business development, you know, this community is really far out front. And so I'm, I'm very proud of you, Mary Cassidy. I'm very proud of all of you for staying the course here in San Leandro. Uh, you know, reapportionment occurred last term. And so, you know, I uh, finally was able to represent San Leandro and, and got Alameda back. And it's really been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you very much for it. And we'll open for Q&A because I know you, there's a lot on your mind. Uh, I just tried to give you kind of a glimpse of what's taking place in D.C. for this week. But oh God, there's so much more. NSA spying, trying to bring, rein in this administration <laughs> on the wiretapping so that your privacy is protected. I mean, we're working on that day and night. So trying to stop this war in Afghanistan and bring our troops home. Trying to do that very quickly. I'm trying to keep us, uh, you know, I'm the United Nations representative from the House to the United Nations. Right. Really so I'm trying to keep us from getting into more wars, such as Syria. So, you know, we're working on a lot of fronts, but we're working on those fronts because of you. And so I really appreciate it. We'll open now for Q&A. Thank you again. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I actually have some questions for you about um, veterans services and benefits. And I understand from uh, Sandra this morning that I was erroneous in not realizing that you were a friend of the military and a friend of the veterans. Yeah, my dad, uh, 25 years, military officer, uh, I'm an army brat, and you know, my, my family's been through two wars, and so there's no way I could not be a friend of veterans and I, I, young men and women who are fighting so bravely and who are serving this country. And I thank you for that. And I will also say that um, my, my personal issues are being addressed by um, Jonathan Gast. Mm -hmm. I've never met him, we've spoken over the phone. So my personal issues aside, I did a lot of fighting for myself until I got to the point where I felt I needed your office's help. Um, one of the problems, the main problem that I have with the VA, specifically in Northern California, is the lack of communication to veterans about what is available to the veteran in terms of benefits. The fact that there are programs that are implemented to specifically address um, very high-risk veterans, veterans who are homeless, veterans who maybe because of PTSD, are substance abusers, but there's nothing for the rest of us. You know, the ones who are, are on the edge because of something that happened in the economy, something that happened with their job, and they're just barely hanging on. It's my understanding, I was fortunate enough because of my personality to cross paths with someone who is in the homeless veterans support program and even though I didn't meet all of the criteria, he went out of his way to help me and to get information and to work with me and keep me in track. So I am actually disappointed to hear that that program is going to be phased out come the end of this year. And it's a very, very beneficial program, especially if veterans out there know about it. And the VA needs to do a better job from the regional office to the medical center. The medical centers are probably the one place where veterans are on a weekly, daily, monthly basis. That operation, the VA medical center, needs to do a better job of helping the veterans and not just waiting until the veteran is high risk. The other issue would be the VA just implemented a dental insurance program. I just found out about it. How did I find out about it? I had an appointment yesterday in San Francisco and I saw a flyer posted somewhere. I haven't received anything in the mail, wow. nothing. I received something in the mail telling me that I, I, no long, I don't have to worry about the Affordable Care Act. I'm covered, I'm enrolled, I'm covered. However, if I pick up the phone and call 911 and have to be rushed to Highland Hospital, if there isn't anyone there to pick up the phone and call the VA and get pre-approval, 
I'm not covers. You know what? Can I just make a couple comments? First of all, uh, the V. You know, one of the issues that we've been dealing with now for a couple of years is back the backlog in claims. Uh, we're integrally involved with trying to help constituents with uh, the VA. A lot of the information, you're right, is not available until you call and you don't know what questions to ask if you don't know what's available, you know, so it's a real catch-22. So for any of you who are having issues with the VA, I meet with the um, Secretary of the Veterans Administration all the time with our local people. We've held several uh, VA events uh, where we had at least 500, 600 veterans show up and we've had workshops and, and fix it kind of uh, sessions where veterans get their claims processed or and we watch them and provide oversight. Congresswoman Jack Spare myself. So we will definitely uh, look into any of your cases and stay in touch with my office. I just want to mention to you a couple of things. I don't, well one thing, I don't know if any of you knew Elaine Cutler in my office. Elaine handled our uh, veterans disability claims in VA cases. She died this week. And, I, and she was phenomenal. She loved you. She was 24-7 in the office. She knew the VA very well. Can we just have a moment of silence for Elaine, please? Thank you very much. And, and I know uh, Elaine would would want us to continue uh, her work. And Jonathan and my entire staff, they're phenomenal. And so they're going to continue working with, with our veterans and to try to help you weed through this enormous bureaucracy, because that's what it is. So thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. And Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year. Uh, my name is Savari Wilson. I am a resident, a long-term resident for over 25 years in Oakland, California. And I'm, I'm really troubled. I've been troubled for some time, and this is my opportunity to express what I'm really feeling. There was a time in Oakland where many people did not want to come to the neighbor, to the community, because it was completely blighted, uh, drug-infested, crime-infested, what have you. Over the past 25 years, a lot has changed. Some good things and some bad things. We've seen a lot of people, a slew of newcomers moving into Oakland, whereas otherwise you wouldn't see them moving in there. So it's amazing what the economy would make people do when they otherwise wouldn't want to do. So a lot of people are moving out of San Francisco and into Oakland. And I'm concerned, I'm really concerned that what's happening in San Francisco is gonna start happening in Oakland. A lot of people are gonna be started being zoned out, priced out, and moved out of Oakland. Just look at West Oakland, Uptown. Look at what's happening at this whole new Whole Food market, the community. A whole slew of people are moving in and pushing the long-term residents out of there. And they're redefining this community the way that they want to see it defined. I don't have a problem with change. I have a problem when this change is happening and black people and brown people are not included and in, in, in are at the table. So I'm concerned. San Francisco has lost a number of their black residents. 12% used to be black people. Now they're down to 5%. I'm concerned this is going to happen in, in Oakland. So I want to know what is, they may, they may not, but it may. I don't want to get to the point where, well, well, we could have done this, we should have done this. But I want to know what is your administration doing or what can I do to help your administration? What can we do collectively to ensure that there will be a black presence that is valued and respected in Oakland? And there is also economic development for our youth and for all those who are trying to work in, in Oakland and live in Oakland. Well, th thank you very much. I too am concerned about gentrification. This has happened. There are waves of gentrification that occur. Now, uh, I'm not a local official, but I can tell you at the national level, on all of our HUD projects, on any federal money that comes in, we want to insist that diversity, both ethnic diversity, economic diversity, be preserved. <laughs> Zoning policies, housing policies, those are local issues that people have to address at the local level. But I can tell you, we need to make sure that those who want to stay in Oakland, that the that rents are stabilized, where the rents don't price people out, who are economically uh, at the bottom of the economic run. And, and so it's very complex. 
but we have to hold the line and make sure that people who want to stay in Oakland have a way to stay in Oakland, and that's in any community. And so gentrification, again, it's historic, you know, it's a very difficult issue, but we have to come together to say, hey, we welcome everyone, but we want to maintain the diversity because there's beauty and diversity. This is, is the most diverse congressional district in the country, and I want to see it maintain all forms of diversity. And so thank you for raising that, but at the federal level, you know, which is my job to make sure that federal money comes in and ensures the, the diversity piece and the federal funding and where it's targeted and how we do our federal piece maintains that uh, diversity. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna, well, we'll start here. And Catherine's just gonna take the microphone. We'll get to everybody. Are you gonna come to the bathroom and listen to that question? Sure. <laughs> we'll get there. We're, we're just gonna try to do it systematically. Good morning. My name is Sylvester Nathaniel, and uh, I want to applaud you for the fight that you uh, continue to do for the little people. But my question to you is on the uh, Asian Free Trade Act or agreement that's trying to be made in uh, Congress or secretly or however, and uh, could you explain to us how that would affect more job loss? TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, right? it, to me is NAFTA all over again. I don't support it. We're trying to hold it up and try to defeat it. And we're trying to keep Congress out of the loop. So believe you me, California's lost hundreds of thousands of jobs as a result of NAFTA. We, I support fair and free trade, but it's got to be fair. We've got to deal with labor protections, U.S. jobs, and the environmental protections. And so TPP is something that some of us are organizing around to try to defeat. Thank you. Um, Ms. Lee, my name is Larissa, and I am one of the new Oakland residents that you are speaking of. Um, and so I, I thank you for allowing me to have a microphone. Um, I have a couple questions. My first question revolves around health care. And what are you doing to include holistic health practices in the coverage? because there are so many types, new types of therapies for things such as PTSD um, and, and, other, and other issues that are not included under, under current health care. Um, and also just a comment, um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a member of my local NCPC, um, and when I go to those meetings, that's the, those are the organizing meetings in the local communities, when I go to those meetings, there is a lack of youth, of people my age and younger at those. So, you know, please go to your NCPC meeting and then you can have conversation with, with people who are, have been longtime residents, are elders in the community, as well as people who are moving in and really care and want to, want to reach out and be part of and not be separate from. But thank you very much for that. I, I am a firm believer in alternative medicine, uh, holistic health. Of course, in the Affordable Care Act, we weren't able to, we were barely able to get uh, mental health in there, but we did. <laughs> so, believe you me, single payer for me is the, the better option. That would include more coverage for everything. But given what we're ha dealing with, uh, I, th I believe we got chiropractic care, acupuncture. So in the Affordable Care Act, you have some semblance, but not what we need. And I think sooner or later, we're going to have to go back to the drawing board on, on health care reform. And hopefully when we do, we'll be able to have a full complement of alternative uh, approaches. Because we, I, again, I'm a firm believer. I've seen it, it works, and I understand the medical model is not the only model that Americans uh, should embrace. And everyone should be able to afford it. Absolutely. Good morning, Ursula Reed, San Leandro City Council. And I've asked you this question before. Oh. My family and her folks. I've, I've asked you this question before, but my concern is around our youth and the youth that are between 15 and 18 years old. You know, we have a lot of money coming down right now from Sacramento for local control funding for um, our kids that are in school programs. But I'm concerned about the juveniles that have fallen between the cracks that are catching up that might have 18 credits and uh, nowhere to go from there as far as future. And I'm concerned because they're our future. 
And I know 10 years goes by really quick. And when you have a kid who's 15 now and 25 in a minute, um, they're gonna be running the show. And I just wanna know if there's anything happening on the federal level to address our juveniles. Yeah, these gaps, and you have mentioned this, and I'm, I'm really happy and pleased with your passion for this, Ursula, because these are the kids who, if, if they, first of all, if they drop out of school, they never return and they end up in juvenile hall and state and federal prison, and we know that, okay? And so these gaps have to be addressed. A couple of things at the federal level, well, again, with sequestered budget cuts, not a lot is going on at the federal level, but of course, we're trying to get resources targeted for juvenile justice prevention initiatives at the local level. So it's up to local governments to structure what you want with the federal money, but there's minimal resources. Secondly, there are specific targeted programs for targeted populations. For example, in the Department of Education, uh, Secretary Duncan is focusing on dropout rates among African American boys. And so there's specific initiatives uh, for African American and Latino boys who drop out between 15 and 18. So there's, there's some specific initiatives, not enough, not enough. So I think what we need to do though is make sure at the local level those priorities are what, what they should be here in San Leandro and then insist that the state and the federal government fund what we say are the priorities. And if that's closing these gaps in services for 15 to the 18 year old, then that's what we need to do in terms of our proposals and say this is what we want to do. And I certainly will work with you to make that happen. Okay. Good morning and thank you for pushing the progressive agenda and been supporting you for a long time. But one of the issues that's very uh, crucial is uh, the immigration reform. It seems like, uh, you know, we're, especially the Raza community, we're left out on everything. And the thing is that we got to push for that. On one hand, the war on poverty, it happens but the beggars and the Republican Party are doing the opposite. So, you know, I know you have supported immigration reform, but what's the future? You know, nothing is happening right now. The division of families is happening every day. The pushing, you know, in the sense of how the beggars are trying to push uh, to do away with the 14th Amendment. You know, that regarding if you're undocumented, if you're born here in the United States, you're out. And that leaves a door open for a lot of stuff. So the thing is that, uh, how do you see the fight going? Yeah, thank you very much. Well, let me first of all say, I know we have the votes in the House for comprehensive immigration reform, for HR 15. It's not the best bill, it's not the one I would have written, but that's the bill that we can get off the floor if the speaker would bring it up, okay? So the push right now is to get Speaker Boehner to bring up H.R. 15. Now, he's making noises now. That's about all he's doing. That's more of a piece of a comprehensive immigration, you know, a piecemeal approach. I don't know, they haven't exposed their hand yet, but we're sticking with bring up HR 15 because we know we have the votes to pass it. We've also been dramatizing this in a, in a lot of ways. The uh, fasters, for example, who came to Washington, D.C., several from my district and fasted for 10 to 15 days. You know, some of us as members of Congress fasted with them for a couple of days and we did a rolling fast to try to raise the level of awareness of the importance. And I have to tell you, bringing together the um, African American, Latino, Asian Pacific American, progressive white community, everyone together in this fast was very powerful because finally Boehner and, and the rest of the crowd figured this out, that this was not only a Latino or an Asian Pacific American issue, but black people and white people and everybody cared about the 11 million undocumented who need to be given a pathway to citizenship. And so that, was, that happened in December. So we're kind of doing other activities outside of the box as advocates, because I'm still an activist, really. And so while I have my legislative work to do, you know, I'm personally engaging in a lot of the outside actions to try to make this happen. 
And so hopefully this year, this is an election year, and you have to remember, you know, we've got to hold people accountable at the ballot box. And so hopefully they'll begin to see the value of supporting HR 15. But it hasn't fallen off of our radar. We're just pushing, pushing, pushing. We, we, we're holding the line on the votes in the House. We have 218 votes. Hi, thank you for coming. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. My question is on a bigger scale because I'm very, very concerned about the inability of our legislative body to pass a budget that's reasonable within a timely manner. And as, as an individual, I cannot run my budget the way the Senate and the House run it. And I, I don't get it. You know, and I want to know what are they going to do? And then the second thing is what can I do as an individual to apply pressure besides voting, write letters, jump up and down, have rallies, spark whatever, because to run a budget the way we're running is insane. And we as people are paying for it over and over again. And so I want to know what we can do and how we can do it. Sure. Thank you very much for that because that's exactly what the shutdown showed. We lost $20, 30000000000 billion as a result of the insanity of just holding up the budget to try to repeal the Affordable Care Act, to deny people health care. That didn't make any sense. So now, hopefully, in the, we'll have something coming up. I mean, at the end of the year, this budget, the bad budget that was voted on, at least got us on track to have hopefully what we call regular order. In the next week or so, what you're going to see are some appropriations bills come forward that will put us back on track. Uh, we'll probably have to pass what we call a continuing resolution for two or three days if, in fact, over this weekend we don't meet the time frame to get everything in order so we can be processed to bring forward. So I believe the Republicans do want to see some form of a budget and a process now because everyone took a beating as a result of the shutdown. And so, <laughs> well, somebody kind of, all time. So I'm a Oakland resident, uh, East Oakland resident, um, and my parents just bought a property there. So I'm speaking on probably on behalf of, of the community uh, from that area. Um, this might be a local uh, issue uh, from uh, the area where I live. Uh, I'm a little nervous, <laughs> sorry. Um, there's a lot of um, uh, idle real estate sitting in our communities that are not generating any income that could benefit our communities. So I now that I move into that community and I checked, there are, you know, top three are is generating income is one is grocery stores, the second is liquor, and the third is miscellaneous. So to me it was very crazy to hear those numbers. And when I went into the Oakland uh, website to check for projects to that are in the community. There are ones that are probably like 10 years from now. And to me, it's insane to think that there are idle real estate in our communities that are could be used for so much more than just, um, they're just sitting there. Um, I don't know, you know, on your, at your level, but I don't know as an individual what I could do to kind of get traction on projects that there could be so much more that can be done in these communities. And people are in really in need in the community. Um, I mean, jobs, there are so many things that, that can happen. So I don't know if there's a question in there. No, I, I, I get it. And I think each neighborhood, each council district, you know, need, needs to have, if they don't have a plan, an economic development plan that has housing, you know, low to moderate income housing, and commercial 
you know, property attached to the plan. A couple of things at the federal level that we're doing, you know, there are promise zones that we're trying to target resources into communities such as the ones you're talking about, but also neighborhood stabilization funds through HUD. Uh, I know Alameda County uh, received, I think it was 11 million a couple years ago. I'm not sure if Oakland's uh, grant was approved, but I'm going to talk to the mayor and, and see where we are in that because what neighborhood stabilization funds do from HUD is they cut, the money is targeted to neighborhoods and where there are abandoned properties. Local residents, and we did this, uh, Congresswoman Maxine Waters, I was chairing the Black Caucus during this time, it was during the Chris Dodd uh, legislation. We put this into that neighborhood stabilization funds, into that financial reform bill where we would target resources into communities where the foreclosure crisis had been, you know, the worst. Hire local residents to rehab these homes and to rent them back to people if they wanted to come back to their homes or to rent them out to others. And so that, that would take care of a lot of the abandoned homes in some of these neighborhoods. And so also neighborhood stabilization funds would do other things with other types of properties. So I'll look into the federal piece on that. But I think it's incumbent upon you and the residents of the community to really get together with your city council member and talk about the plans and your vision and what you think you would like to see. And we certainly will help on the federal level. Good morning, uh, my name is Jeanette, and there have been a couple of times I've called your office and I want to commend your staff because when I didn't understand some things, I talked to whoever answered the phone and they helped me to understand. But the reason I came here this morning is because I was listening to your opening statement about um, the 50 year anniversary of uh, President Johnson's war on property. And, uh, when you're faced with something yourself is a total different, you have a total different outlook on things. And I was working for one of those companies she was talking about getting tax subsidies last year. And I was making about $60,000. This year, I'm not working at that company. And I'm faced with homelessness. But I think that in, in, in my life experience, I've come to realize that that's probably a good thing because I had a dream and it was lines and lines and lines and lines of people. And they were from all walks of life. And they were in this line going towards a church. And um, I didn't really understand what that dream was, but now everywhere I drive and everywhere I look, sometimes I'm driving trying to find a place for me and my grandchildren to sleep. But I'm fortunate because I got a car. And I see individuals walking the street all night long. If they're not walking, they're riding bikes. They're sleeping everywhere. I went uh, for my church, and I'm gonna give a plug to my church, New Birth, Oakland, <laughs> Bishop Carl Smith. And um, I went and looked out in uh, homeless encampments so we could give them some uh, food for Thanksgiving. It was amazing to me. To see a city like Oakland, I'm from, I came from Chicago, moved here 30 something years ago. When I came here, it was wonderful. I love California. Drove down 580, was mesmerized by the mountains and just was just, oh, I gotta move back. But it's amazing to me. Nobody in here, and sometimes I go to other meetings, nobody mentions the fact or the subject of homelessness. Nobody says anything about it. And that's because, like I said, we're all sort of living a good life. We have a lot of problems and challenges. But when you're hit with that reality of being homeless, sleeping in your car, it's a total different situation. And this young man talking about the blight and the houses and all of that kind of stuff, I would drive down the street and I said, well, why is that boarded up? Why is that boarded up? And I was talking to a friend of mine who knows you. I, 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 we'll talk, hopefully she's gonna try to talk to you. And I said, girl, we need to get those houses, take those boards off those windows, and open up some homeless shelters. And it makes sense. And I'm sorry, I don't mean to take up all this time, but this thing has been burning in me. I've been sitting in my car, and I've been praying, and I've been saying, I, 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 he said, you gotta be bold. That's right. We need to do something about this problem. It is ridiculous. 
And these are just not individuals. Uh, people and I talk to them and say, oh, they're just drunks. They need to go get a job and they need to this. I said, I'm not a drunk. I'm not an addict. I've been saved 30 some years, filled with the Holy Spirit, love God, and I'm sleeping in my heart. That's right. Listen, first of all, thank you for uh, your bravery and being so bold as to share your story yes. with us today. Uh, and yes, that homelessness should prick the conscience of every American because in America we should not have one homeless person. That's right. And we have so many even homeless veterans. That's right. Which should be an oxymoron. One of the uh, things we need to do and, and talk to you, there are a lot of nonprofits around here who are working on programs. You, you shouldn't have to worry about sleeping in your car. You, no one should. Uh, we would need to organize all of the homeless services because I think here in Alameda County, and believe it or not, this is one of the best counties in the country, yeah. Yeah. the Amen. best in the country that addresses homelessness, and we still have too many people on the streets and who are homeless. And so we'll work with you and get those organizations galvanized and get you the names of people that we can help you, you with your personal situation, okay? But also, in addition, if any of you know people or are, are concerned about initiatives around the homeless, let us know because our office, we work very closely with, with the organizations of people who are homeless. But just know that what's taking place in this country in terms of income inequality, she just laid out. Right. More people who were working, who were part of the middle class, have now fallen into the ranks of the poor. And the ranks of the poor, people who are poor, are trying to get out of poverty. And so you have this CEO, mega billion profit, corporate elite who are making all the money and all the profits, and the majority of America is now, even middle income people are falling into the ranks of the poor. So we've got to address income inequality in a big way. And I think here in Alameda County, even though we have a long way to go, uh, you have some wonderful county officials who are doing the right thing. We just need more resources and targeted more resources into this community. So we will definitely try to work with you just on your own personal situation. But just know we have many groups around here who are working. Yeah. Yep, and you're right about the board, but again, there's HUD money, and you know, there are resources around here to do some of this if we could just be a little bit better organized. So thank you again. Um, Ms. Lee, uh, I'm on Social Security, and the first two years of Barack Obama in the White House, you all saw Democrats had both houses, control of both houses. Our Social Security check was frozen for two years, no cost of living adjustment. And in the last two years, the cost of living adjustment was one and a half percent. Do you well, guys? Let me, let me just first say, I hear this from my 89-year-old mother every day. <laughs> as, as hell. I can't come home every week without her telling me exactly what she just said. So. Now, uh, that's the question. You guys really yeah. pay bills or go to the store in, on top of that, our savings are depleted because of high inflation and low interest rates. So uh, what we have here is my rent went up 20% in the last two years. So we, we have that situation and nobody is talking in Congress at all about people on social security. Quite the, quite the opposite. They are talking about cutting of this or that or the other. So, uh, I, I don't know if I really want to ask you to do something because you already have some years there and, and I don't see anything. Well, okay? let me tell you the politics of what's taking place that you just laid out. First, what we're trying to do in Congress is to keep them from cutting. So, so that's all we're doing right now is treading water because we have a, you saw this as a result of government shutdown. We got a hardcore 60 Tea Party members who want to get rid of Social Security, Medicaid, and Medicare. Okay, they want to get rid of it. That's not right, and we're just spending that off. Secondly, the formula around cost of living increases as it relates to Social Security needs to be revisited. <laughs> because what has happened in terms of the freeze is they peg this according to the uh, inflation rates. And so if the rate of inflation is whatever it is, and it doesn't meet that test, then they then Social Security benefits are frozen. And to me, that's wrong, because like you say, your rent has gone up. You know, people have real bills to pay. So once we can make sure we protect Social Security, because it's fragile right now, but you know, 
you even hear some Democrats sometimes talking about, let's look at chain CPI, which is another formula that would hit, uh, which would be a benefit cut. So we've got to kind of just hold the line right now until we can politically get our house in order so we can move forward and try to make some of these major changes. But you're absolutely right. And again, I, I know this very well because I hear from my mother every single week when I come home. And we have a, a lot of work to do in Washington as it relates to our senior citizens. Uh, good morning and thank you for coming. Uh, I didn't come today to talk about this, but since it was a, you know, one of your issues about unemployment, I just want to say that uh, the company that I worked for for 28 years, I'm still employed there. We have lots of jobs available for people that want to work. And uh, Alameda, Oakland, Hayward, we yeah. do have those jobs available. And um, they're year round. You do have Kaiser and you have 401k. But today my issue is coming for about affordable housing. Uh, living at a resident for 22 or 30 something years and being forced out because affordable housing takes over the complex. And now the people don't qualify three times the rent to move into other places, so we become homeless. And it needs to be something done about the affordable act, uh, housing. And affordable housing also, they are not telling you, they have no information when you go to them to explain what's going on. They just tell you to be out the place in 60 days. Uh, where, where do you live? Lakeside Village in San Leandro, 22 oh, years. And we have hundreds of people that have been forced out. And yesterday, I called an attorney, and we called back Monday to see uh, about something needs to be done about it. Yeah, I think we need to organize. Tenants need to organize, really, around. Because the more we see, the as the housing market comes back, the, the increases in rent are going to continue. And house, housing, once again, is going to become totally unaffordable. So I think people who are renters need to organize and we need to look at, I don't know if San Leandro has any rent control policies, I don't know what the ordinances are here, but I definitely think you need to pursue that. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara Lee, for having this town hall meeting. Um, what I want to talk about are the assault weapons, and I hope this hasn't been addressed yet. Uh, I have to now take care of my 87-year-old mother, and uh, we have a choice of living in one of my rentals that one of my tenants is going to be moving out of. And every night we hear ba 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 and I'm afraid for my mom to go to the store or any of those things. And uh, we're kind of in a quandary right now because she can't afford these incredible costly assisted living things. So I have to move to one of my uh, rentals that are you know, kind of in the flatlands because we need a bigger place so I can take care of her. And my question is, I've heard of this thing called spotter something. I mean, um, is there something where they can target or know where these assault weapons are? I mean, is this gonna get better? Or, I know it's a national problem, I read the papers, I understand this, but I have to make a real quick decision about what I'm gonna do with my mom and what I'm trying to find out is, is this spotter thing that I've heard of, is this active, is it happening, can they target at the minute the thing goes off that that's where the gun is, or is yeah. this fiction? Okay, you know, and I, believe me, I'm really sorry you have to live like this. You know, no one should have to live in America under the fire, gunfire, each and every night, and especially senior citizens and children. It's, it's, that's, it's awful. And th th they say it works, the jury's still out. I really don't know. I'd have to look into it. But uh, I think even if it's working, that still doesn't address the problem. We need to get assault weapons off the street. We need a full assault yes. weapon ban. Yes. We need gun, gun control. We need to get AK-47s, all these. And, and California has a pretty strong assault weapon ban. But we don't have the national laws that because people bring guns in from other states. So background checks, gun safety latches, you know, all the just the moderate stuff we can't even get through the Congress because of the NRA. And and so all of these things that are taking place at the local level to try to just minimize or mitigate against that are good things, but I can't tell you whether or not uh, for certain that it's working. But I would urge you, uh, and we'll help facilitate a discussion with you and the police department so you can know 
for a fact so you can make a decision on whether or not it makes sense or not for you to stay there. Okay. So my staff, and let me just say, my staff is here today. Anything we say, uh, we mean, so just follow up with my staff. They're phenomenal. They work 24-7. And uh, if I say we're going to do something, we're going to do something. So just find one of them and give them your name, phone number, and follow up with them next week. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Jeanette Harper, and I'm a lifelong resident of Oakland in my 50 years. And one of the things that I noticed is that it's unfortunate, but to a, to a certain extent, Section 8 subsidizes poverty. Because what's happening is you have a lot of landlords they buy the properties, but it's, it's strictly investment properties. So they don't maintain the properties. They rent it out to anybody. The weeds are as tall as I am. Trash is strewn all over. I say all that to say that I feel like what is a good program is being misused because there's no enforcement. Nobody comes out and checks. I feel like those type of landlords and owners, they need to be fined a tremendous amount of money and that money could be put into a fund to help people that are homeless or help people purchase homes or help law enforcement because my opinion is that it makes neighborhoods um, that aren't well maintained and invested in, it gives comfort and aid to the criminal mentality. And I don't want to see anything happen to that program, but my fear is if it continues to go in the direction that it is, it'll be easy to justify it because you'll have so-called thugs and, and, and dope uh, dealers and, and substance abusers maintaining the property. And the, and the thing is, I also feel like to a certain extent, the criteria to who those homes are sold to, especially in blighted areas, there should be a different criteria. Do you live in the area? Are you gonna be here? Because you buy these properties and you off an Alamo somewhere and you don't care. And there's nobody to report it to, there's nothing. So I feel like that there should be some type of mechanism to monitor our, our neighborhoods. Because I live in the flatlands, but I'm raised, I'm proud, I'm respectful, I'm all that. And I feel like, you know, we're being mislabeled so they don't care what kind of, what kind of investment is made. You know, it's raggedy, it's the hood, I'm gonna buy it, I'm gonna put somebody raggedy in there, and I'm gonna make my money, and that's that. Let me tell you, now I know HUD, I, I know HUD, in order to qualify as a Section 8 landlord, HUD has certain criteria and certain uh, guidelines and certain requirements. What, I, what it sounds like is happening, we're going to look into the, they're not monitoring it because landlords cannot do this if they're HUD, uh, Section 8 landlords. Okay, now maybe the maybe HUD will say it's the budget cuts that have kept their enforcement section from being real. I don't know, but we'll look into it because that, that you're absolutely right. Uh, Section 8 has specific, very clear guidelines on the types of properties, on how properties must be maintained. And I, yeah, no, I know, I hear what you're saying, but so we're going to look into it and find out why they're not enforcing what they say is the require are the requirements for landlords. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think, write it back, we'll just have to write it back there. Because we're going to come this way. Someone, right? Yeah, we're trying to get everyone from the back and then move around to this direction. Good morning, Congresswoman Lee. I'm Frank Wealthy from San Leandro, and I'm with the California Council of the Blind. And uh, I, I know that you care about disability issues because I was, I was there when you were uh, there at the dedication of the Ed Roberts campus a couple of years ago up in Berkeley, beautiful building up there. And I, I know that you're aware of the astronomical unemployment rate among people with disabilities running, you know, whether the economy is good or bad, it seems to run around 70% no matter what. And do you have any thoughts about things that can be going on at the federal level that you want to be involved with to make that get better? Yeah, my sister actually has multiple sclerosis, and so I've been very involved in issues around the disabled for many, many, many years. Part of what we need to do, you know, there's certain uh, requirements where uh, if you're disabled, you can't work unless you make, uh, uh, if you've met a certain threshold in terms of income. So we need to really look at that and fix that. But also, it's important, I think, for employers not to discriminate against people who are disabled. You know, people can work in making sure that the adequate equipment and the ADA compliance is there. 
it just makes it a lot easier. So we have to do a better job with employers to tell employers that they should hire the disabled because they can do uh, just as competent a job as, as anybody else. That's right. Amen. Good morning. My name is Theodora. I live in San Leandro. I own a business in Oakland that I've had for 23 years. And my comment and question is about um, the living wage. I feel that you know everyone should be able to make a living wage. But what happens to the smaller companies, McDonald's and Chrysler and General Motors? They can afford to um, take people $15, $20 an hour. My business is a nursing registry. I take care of clients living with AIDS. I take care of the elderly. And we're reimbursed by the government. If we're only paid um, $17 an hour, how can we survive if, we're, if we have to pay um, our employees $15 an hour? Yeah, we well, have, just, you know, just like, Small employers, for example, are exempt from the Affordable Care Act. So I mean, they're for smaller employers and for the non-mega corporations. You know, there has to be a different formula. I agree. But for McDonald's and for fast food operators and for the mega corporations, paying seven dollars and twenty-five cents an hour is wrong. I understand it, but is there going to be that separation? Is it, who's well, going to say? What I'm saying is it should be, and that's what we always work on, as, as we did with the Affordable Care Act, to try to make sure that smaller employers who are providing services and who are doing a good job and barely getting by, either the, the contracts reimburse at that rate of a living wage, or that there are some exemptions so that you can continue to not only survive, but to thrive. And, and there are ways to do that, and we can do it, and we should do that. And then my last question is, um, as I said, we provide home care to clients living with AIDS um, under the Ryan White Act. And our problem is, um, I've been doing this now for 20 years, as I said, we, um, it takes them three months to reimburse us, and we, we, we have no recourse who we can talk to. We provide the services. We, we never turn down any clients. It's very hard for a small company to put a bill for yeah. government Why does it take months. three months to get reimbursed? Is it from HHS or? This is, well, who do you get reimbursed? from the Office of AIDS. Office of AIDS, yeah. Yes. OK. State, so, federal, Office of AIDS, or uh, state? I don't mean the county. I mean county, OK. Yeah. Okay, why don't we follow up with my office, because it shouldn't take three months. I'm a former small business owner myself for 11 years, and I know what this late payment can do. It can really lead you out of business, set you out of business. So we'll see why it's three months and see if we can help. All right, thank you. William Max down here, a former, uh, no, former uh, um, Army brat. Uh, this deals with uh, the cost of health care. I have multiple sclerosis, and I used a tricell mattress on my bed that I get through my insurance. I wanted to get some um, mattress sheets that specifically fit on this mattress here. So I finally got a hold of the right people that sell them, and I said I wanted two. And they said, are you sure? And I, and they, and I said, why? He said, because they cost $3,400 a piece. Somebody's making a lot of money. And, well, and I said, who can afford that? And she said, insurance company. So that's, that's why our health care is Because we're paying $3,400 for a fitted sheet of mattress. Yeah. That's, that's horrible. And that's part of what in the Affordable Care Act why uh, we kept a cap at, at overhead. Because the cost, the cost of health care are not because of you and your, your benefits and, and what you need, but it's because of the insurance companies and the manufacturers who are gouging people as a result of that. And so hopefully we'll be able to bring the cost of care down by dealing with, you know, the gouging as you just uh, laid out. That, that's outrageous. But, you know, a lot of people making money. And the insurance industry is a mega industry and they're making billions of dollars off of us. My comment is going to be quick. First of all, I want to thank you so very much. I am 70 plus. And I realize that one person alone cannot make the difference. But I commend you on standing along 
and not supporting the Iraq War. Yeah. So to me, that proves that if we all get behind you and support you, it makes it possible for you to bring others in that are representative to represent we the people. Yeah. And not them themselves, which for the most part is going on at this time. So, I have found out so much information because there is a lack of communication when it comes to people like me. But thank you so very much, my dear. Well, thank you so much. Well, I thank you for those very humbly and gracious remarks, but also just know that sometimes you just have to step out there and, and do what you think is right and what you believe in, and sooner or later others will come around. And I think you're seeing that now as it relates to Syria. We've been very involved in trying to keep this administration from going to war in Syria. Others are following our lead. You know, and so it takes time, but we have to continue to fight for peace and for justice because we want a world that's worthy of our children. So thank you. Hi, I'm Paige McAdoo. I wrote your letter complaining about uh, the fact that um, I have a terminal degree and I haven't been working for six months. I'm wondering what can be done at the federal level, um, whether it's possible, whether they're looking at what the Germans did, for example. The Germans actually paid employers to keep people on. Yeah. Um, is, is there any movement on this? I mean, I, you know, my social security, uh, unemployment ran out, and I'm just living on savings, hoping that I don't coast into uh, a, a, a financial catastrophe. I mean, it's not really a matter of how much education a person has now. I have four degrees and a terminal degree, you know. And I'm an adjunct professor, and it's like, you know, I think the janitors make more than me. God bless them. I want to tell it. But I mean, you know, what's the point of this? And I've got student loans up the yin yang. I mean, is there any any possibility that anything's going to change? Well, believe you me, we're we're fighting hard. Now. We we're trying to get an infrastructure investment so people can work on re rebuilding the roads and our infrastructure. We're trying for a public works initiative. I, I'm telling you, and when I hear your story, I mean, your story is a story of millions and millions of people who uh, we can't seem to get enough votes, and this is what it takes. This is political. Enough votes to invest in job creation. And that's what we're all fighting for. And, you know, and, and it pains me to hear your story because you're making it real. You're not just a statistic like you know you hear about. And just know that I can't tell you what is going to happen, but we're bringing in every federal dollar I can find for my district to create jobs. You know, we brought in money for the port. We brought in money for our transit systems. We're bringing in money every day, but it's not enough. And so until we get a national policy for full employment, a national policy to invest in infrastructure, public works, and all of the we have legislation for that. I mean, it's not like in Congress we're not trying to get it done. But the politics of it right now are very, very dismal. And you see what's going on. The government was shut down. And if, so if they can shut down the government, you know they're not going to go along with helping us try to figure out how to create jobs. So I would say to you, try to uh, look toward what we're sending in federal money you know, try to see if there are any, and we can refer you to some of the organizations that have received some federal money and just see what job openings are there and maybe we can help you kind of open some doors for you, okay? But it's very, uh, and I don't want to try to sugarcoat what's taking place at the federal level. Well, it just seems like there's some good ideas out there. I thought that idea with the Germans, they said that they paid these employers and they got like two or three times the benefit out of it because these people didn't lose their skills they were in the in the in the uh, market putting money in. Why can't we? Sure, do but you have to have the political will to yeah, do that. You're and right. there are some that came to Congress. You have to have votes who believe that government has no role and that we need to dismantle it and end it. And that's what what we're faced with when we talk about these good ideas. When we try to get votes to get something passed like this, there are those who say no, 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 no. You know this is. 
Let people pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Let them go for it. We don't need any government kind of support. So we're faced with a real crisis in this country of people who want the kind of ideas that you're suggesting and those who just want to dismantle the whole shebang. And that's the crisis that we're facing. Well, unfortunately, we don't have enough of you. I've watched what you've done, and I've heard what these others have done. I don't know how they can elect people like uh, Bonner and uh, Ryan. I mean, these people are a disgrace. Yeah. We're going to try to take care of that. Okay, what do you mean? Because I know there's some people in the gallery who'd like to ask questions, so I'll be quicker in my responses. Yeah, I was here when you gave your uh, first uh, public meeting after election, and I was the one that told you that you were my hero, <laughs> and you still are my hero. Um, yeah, I came in with a single issue of education, but there's you know so much that's been brought up. Uh, my own personal experience, I came out of foster care, eight foster homes, very dysfunctional family, uh, homeless. I went you know, sleeping on the beach in Santa Cruz, uh, sleeping in chairs and bowling alleys, those types of things. And then I stumbled on SSI, stumbled on EOPS. Um, now I and then um, got into college, the age, you know, over the age of 30. Um, and now taught for 35 years, Ursula Reed was my, my favorite principal. Um, <laughs> and retired, now I'm back in substituting, and I'm going around to different districts. And what I am finding is that separate but unequal is back. And it's, no, it's not based on race anymore. It's uh, poverty, it's income, it's like, all these issues. You go to one school and every kid has an iMac computer on their desk. You go to another school, and they have torn textbooks where a little girl opens a book and there's a picture of a penis uh, drawn in it and the books are torn up. My personal experience, you know, and we, we're dealing with 35, 40 kids in a classroom. I was subbing in a second grade classroom. Uh, we were doing language arts. I had 34 kids, okay? Six more came in, sat in the back of the room. I went to the office and said, we have 40 kids. Oh, no, no, six of those are not her roster so they don't count. Yeah. Well, you know, I think what, what you, since we have, I just want to thank you for that. But what you're seeing, though, is a manifestation of income inequality, right? And what and the gaps now. Okay, so I want to ask so, you, and, and what I came right. here for was to hook up with somebody in your office with the economic issues, because uh, every child left behind and race to the top just yeah, didn't work. Makes it's it, not working. It, it no, it work. does work. It's it makes race to the top. Yeah, it raised to the top. It makes the gap wider. Right, yeah, that's right. And so how can how yeah. can we stop that? How can yeah. we get away from this idea that test scores indicates yeah. teachers' quality? Uh, one more thing. You said you United Nations, and you said there's no reason anybody in this country should be homeless. I would like to uh, say that there's no reason why anybody in the world that's true. should be homeless or die, you know, young that's kids. True. That's true. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to have to move along as quickly as possible because we still have a few more. And if we don't get to all of the questions, my staff will be here. We'll be around to answer them individually. I know some people got here early and want to leave. Hello, uh, my name is Erica Carter. I'm a, uh, I was born and raised in Oakland. I'm a staunch advocate of you and your policies. And I just like a quick comment because you're not know, going to leave uh, pretty soon. But I just want to say you brought up early on in your statements here about. Uh, people voting and uh, making changes by our policies. And I think that's the main goal, the main thing we need to get from, from this meeting, mm -hmm. town hall meeting, that we need to fight yes. a good fight. We need to make these people responsible for the decisions and actions because we live the consequences yes. of these actions. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you very much. And if you don't get your question answered, have an opportunity to ask a question. We do have comment cards on the back as you exit. Uh, excuse me, there's a, there's a lady up here. Uh, we'll, we're getting up there okay. as soon as we go through this road. Right? Uh, my name is John and I live in Oakland and I, I want to thank you for all you're doing to stand for justice and well-being of people here and in the world. I've been 
paying a lot of attention lately to what is going on in Syria. And as you know, we kind of dodged a bullet, or they dodged a bullet of a military attack. But and meanwhile, there are approximately 6 million Syrians who have been either displaced internally and are homeless or are refugees. And more than a million of them are in besieged areas that um, armed groups are not allowing food and medicine to come in in many cases for more than a year. And so there are many, many, many Syrians who are living on eating animal feed. And um, so in, in about 10 days, there will be talks in Geneva. Uh, the United States will have a, a place at the table there. The Syrians, I know, say that the United States has a lot of cards to play. So my request to you is whether you, as the House of Representatives representative to the UN General Assembly, would talk with Ambassador Susan Rice and urge her to highlight the humanitarian situation and to try and get a binding agreement for access for food and medical supplies. Um, and if, if that doesn't occur in Geneva, to, to try and introduce that in the UN Security Council. Um, and secondly, on the, on the Appropriations Committee, I know that most of this is happening right now, but the Senate approved $132 million for, for UNICEF, much of which is for the Syria Fund. And if um, you can talk with uh, Ms. Lowy about trying to support that in the House as well. to take it out, you know, already on UNICEF, and I'm fighting to try to keep it in. I'm on the subcommittee that authorizes that in the House. And secondly, on Syria, uh, we've already communicated, we'll communicate about the humanitarian crisis and to make this a uh, requirement. A lot of these refugees are in Turkey and in Jordan, and it's really uh, putting a lot of pressure on the people and the governments of those countries. But inside, so, there, there inside, are more than a million people who are also yeah. And, and so we've given some materials to your staff here locally. Yeah, that okay. And we definitely will continue to push for access for humanitarian organizations to get in into all of the camps, and especially in Syria. Yeah, to very the urgent, supplies. timely. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for being here. I'm Wendy Douglas. <laughs> and my question is, the government is providing money for different departments to assist, <laughs> providing money for different departments. <laughs> to assist people that need legal help. Mm -hmm. And it's not the legal help is not being provided. I had a problem. I called the mayor's office twice, no help. Legal aid, no help. No one that is supposed to provide legal help is assisting different people. The police department told me I could not file any police report when individuals enter my apartment illegally, smoking pot, stealing, and I can't get any legal help. And the government is providing the money for that. And there is no assistance. Okay, well, let me find out which organizations are getting government money. Every last and one then we'll, from the we'll, mayor's office on. Okay, okay, but we'll look at where the money's going and then get those organizations. <laughs> I think right, right here with Kathy. Thank you, Congresswoman Lee. My name is Faye Jenkins, and I'm from San Leandro. And my question has already been addressed about Social Security. But what i like to know is what can we do to help you fight? Social Security that they won't cut our Social Security because that's what we worked for. That's we right. not freeloaders. Yeah. We work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's not a handout. No, it's not. Yeah. So I think what you can do is, you know, I got your back. Preach to the choir with me, but you have friends and family around the country who live in other places. Get to them and tell them to get to their members of Congress and tell their members of Congress hands off of Social Security. Okay. That's what we have to do, be part of a national coalition. We're going to have to move upstairs and answer a few questions up there. Then we'll, we'll come back. Okay, okay. Right right here, once we finish. Okay, once we finish up here, we'll come back here, because time's moving on. And I'll be around for a few minutes to talk. About so first of all, as a, as a school board member, thank you for your advocacy on behalf of education. Um, you brought up the issue of um, NSA surveillance, and um, I appreciate your opposition to that and, and efforts to reform the program. But another place where you can help reform is federal grants often support the same kind of transfer of surveillance technology to local police departments by the United States Department of Justice um, in the form of 
license plate scanners and cameras, but also in the form of mil former military weapons going to our police forces. And I would strongly encourage you and your colleagues to work against those kinds of transfers of surveillance technology to our local police departments as well. Thank you. Okay, Th thank you very much. Okay, we're going, we're gonna have to move as quickly as possible because we have a couple more down here. We'll, we'll be back and then we'll be around to ask questions in a Barbara, I just want to say thank you so much for helping me on the past. Uh, my name is Jorge Flores. I've been in this country for almost 25 years. Um, when I came here, I was homeless. I was living in the street. And, and then I got myself educated, looking for job for everywhere. Now I'm, I'm a teacher. I teach computer classes. I work for Occur and um, single parents. My question today is about the education. My son goes to school here in San Leandro, and it was denied it because of his disability. Yesterday, I received a call that said, Mr. Flores, your son have a behavior, and we're going to punch him and stand in the school to 6 o'clock. I said, I want my child now. I'm sorry, Mr. Flores, we have our own policy. We're going to keep your child here to 6 o'clock in the time room. The time room is a place, it's like a jail. They don't have no window, just a door, and with the security guard. And I said, I want my child back. I don't even know what to do. I called the police. The police told me, whatever the school district told you, that's what you have yeah. to follow. Let me, let me just, a couple of things. Let me, we'll put you in touch with your school board member. I, I would ask that all of the questions and issues around anything local, uh, let me know later and we'll put you in touch with the appropriate local officials and to keep kind of focus on the federal work that we're doing as your federal representative. But we definitely will put you in touch with your school board member here locally. Uh -huh. Hello, my name is Barbara and I've lived in East Oakland for over 30 years. I have uh, two questions or two comments. One. I, I, I hope you can help me understand why the federal employees received back pay for all that time when they weren't working. Um, it would be nice if we got that. Okay, let me just answer that real quick. They weren't working through no fault of their own. They were actually laid off by the stupidity of the Congress. Oh, I understand that, but so are we sometimes. No, so, no, I um, the, you know, I think it's a little unfair, seeing it's our tax dollar. And the other point is, I've heard here a number of things that it relates back to monitoring of where our federal dollars go and how are they spent. I have worked for many years in a federally funded program and the waste of funds is absolutely deplorable. And I, I really urge you to look into that, especially with uh, HUD okay. and other programs. Well, let, us, let us follow up with you on this. Thank you for calling us. So okay. Good morning. Thank you for what you've done, and thank you for what you will continue to do. Uh, I'm Lucella Harrison, and I'm a former member of the Oakland School Board. A number of people here. I've known for 30 years, <laughs> at least. Uh, a number of people here have talked about the, their concerns about education, and I know uh, you're a supporter of, of education for everyone. Um, but I just want to ask at the federal level, um, what's going to be done for students who are preschool, early childhood education? Because all the statistics tell us that if we can get to our children early enough, if we can start them off in preschool and uh, their chances are su of succeeding are much higher. Well, so, you know, you've been on the front on behalf of our children for years and years and years. And let me just quickly say that uh, universal preschool is a key element and pathway out of poverty. I mean, you, you teach kids early they have a better chance of not falling in poverty. The president, and I'm really pleased, in his State of the Union speech, he talked about this, early childhood education. We're coming up with a budget now. I'm on the Appropriations Committee that funds education. 
hopefully next week we'll see a bump in it. We won't see what we need, but at least we've got it on the White House's agenda, okay? And from a federal level, you're going to see a heck of a lot more in terms of early childhood education and pre-kindergarten. Okay. Hi, Barbara. My name is Ruthie Smith, and I live in the city of Oakland. I want to congratulate you on what you're doing and what you guys are doing. But I've been attending the uh, a, a meetings with the city of Oakland. And sometimes it's the police department that's involved talking about crime. And sometimes it is um, Nancy Brooks uh, there talking about the jobs that's coming up from the old Army base. I know that the federal government has uh, provided the city of Oakland with a lot of money. I don't have my notes you know, yeah, from the last year. Yeah, I know we yes. worked on that. And, and, they, and they're talking about um, hiring so many minority uh, contractors. Yeah, local residents, minority women on contracts. Yes. Yeah. And they're talking about also the, if you don't qualify for a certain job, they have uh, some kind of training in West Oakland. You go there and you sign up for it. And once you complete that training, you will have a job provided for you. They talked about uh, the outside jobs. Nobody talked about any inside jobs. And that concerns me. We can do inside jobs as well. You know, and they also talked about that uh, they would work for a living wedge. My question to you, what is a living wedge? You know, the prices of renting apartments, houses, food in the city of Oakland is so high. So what is a living well, wage? Well, I tell you, a living wage <laughs> here, okay, so there have been the, the, there are certain formulas by, and the regional formulas by which a living wage is determined. In the Bay Area, from what I remember, it's about $25, $26 an hour. That's in the Bay Area. Or higher. Still not enough, but that's no. kind of what they pay a living wage at. And, um, Certainly, it's not what it is now, okay. but you know we've got to get to living wage. I don't know what formula they're going to be using for the new jobs that are coming in, but certainly we have to push for as close to okay, living I have wage. Something as we have. Uh, also, uh, at these meetings I've been attending, I do not see any young people there. You know, I'm retired. I'm almost 70 years old, but I'm concerned uh, with people that don't have jobs. I'm concerned with the people that. Uh, Young people that want to work. I know there's an old saying saying you can eat a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. So how do we get the young people to come to these meetings? Well, and we, we have to figure out why they're not coming and if the outreach is being done and if the information is being sent out to the schools and to where they, where they are to our young, to our organizations, the young people participate in. I can't tell you why, but we'll look at find out. I have something else to say. Okay, we're going to have to Can, can I just say one, more, I can say one more thing? Real quick. There was a lady uh, down there talking about the weeds growing up around in, in buildings next to her and all that. Well, on my street, I'm called the enforcer. They don't like me. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, but I want to tell that lady, if you go, if you call to the city of Oakland or go to the city of Oakland, complain about people not keeping up their properties, they will come out and take care of that and charge the owner, send the bill to the owner. Well, thanks for that piece of information. Hopefully that was heard by everybody who that. Hey, hey, hey. There are a couple more up, up there. Three more. You have, have to be very quick now. Okay. This is a quick question. So I um, am disabled. I have a, I'm partially blind, and I rely on public transportation 100%. And I was just wondering what advancements have been made uh, this year and the recent years on the local local level with public transportation as well as on a national level. Because I know there are a few other cities, definitely New York and some other cities, that have good public transportation systems, but there's always room for improvement. So are you saying here at AC Transit is an ADA compliant or we need to ask them to do more? What, what Okay, let me check into that. I, I'll have to call AC Transit to see. Okay, we'll let you know. Hey, the, hello, uh, Mr. Miss Barbara Lee. Uh, my name is Deborah Senegal, and um, I just like to say I'm so glad to be in your presence. And uh, I would just like to say that we just got to keep up the fight, 
and we might just have to get out in the street and march yeah. like we did in the yeah. day, okay? Because Ooh. they're not really listening. Yeah. And I just thank you for going to Washington and bringing light to the darkness yeah. because that's what Amen. we need is light in the darkness. Amen. And kick butt when you go back, okay? Keep kicking butt. Keep kicking butt. We got to get him started up. Don't give me what I need to deal with. Keep kicking butt. Keep kicking butt. Keep kicking butt. I like that's a good segue for me. Uh, how you doing? My name is Latosha Nett. I'm program director at Lifetime in Oakland, low income families empowerment through education. And my question is about TANF on the federal level. And if we don't know what TANF is, TANF is a new word for welfare. Okay, we're talking about cow works. We're talking about food stamps. Right now. Uh, a family of three is getting $300 a month. There's absolutely no way to survive off of $300 a month when you have three people in your family. What are we doing on the federal level to ensure that we can either appropriate, appropriately give these families the money they need to reach economic security, and right now, it's not happening. So we have mothers, we have single mothers, we have single parents, we have children, we have the maximum family cap rule that is not even covering children, that are, that are, that are prohibiting women to, have, to even think about having more children because they're not even covered through the MFG rule. So my question to you, uh, Congresswoman, is what are we going to do about TANF? I know the reauthorization of TANF went out the window and no one else is talking about it anymore. But as an activist, this is what I'm dealing with every day. And we can't, they're trying to cut WIC again, Head Start, every other kind of associated service with TANF. And so not much is being done at all about TANF. And I have to say what we're trying to do now is just hold the line so that more budget cuts don't impact people who are on public assistance. And hopefully we'll be able to reauthorize it, because I don't like the way it's structured now anyway. And we need to re reauthorize it in a real way where it is a program that gives, especially women, a way out of TANF. Job creation, workforce training, child care. We need to increase the funding for child care. So some of what we're doing to increase funding for child care and transportation can help TANF recipients. But we haven't gone back to reauthorize it. And I don't see that happening very soon because of the politics. OK. Thank you, oh, no, Representative. My name is Phil Helena. And I'm frightened half to death. I happen to be 83 years old. I purchased a piece of property in Oakland some years ago and I paid for it. I don't know a penny on it. I have it rented to tenants. I have my place perfect, prepared for people to live, sheltered. I even put a security gate and they have remotes to get in and out of my property. They have, they are in it some for eight years and not paying rent. I've gone to the city of Oakland. There's a big scam going on in Oakland. People, that's a scam going on in Oakland. They came and said, Miss Hill, you have to repair the damage, the structure damage that these people have done and you have a certain period of time to do it in. If not, we will place a lien on your property. One tenant brings in a brother and allows him to open a car repair shop on my patio. And they tear down the back deck. And I have to have it repaired in a certain amount of time. There's been a lot of complaints about various things that tenants and people will do in the city of Oakland, but let me tell you, I'm experiencing, I paid my, I worked three jobs, raised my daughter and my grandkids, put them all through universities, all my own. I didn't ask the city of anybody for anything, and I'm being treated like a slave. I feel now that I'm in the presence of Hitler's people. I say it's a scary thing that I am being told what I can't do. Right now they have complaints after complaints. And I still today, on Monday, I have a contractor that have to meet me there to make repairs 
that they have done, otherwise a lien will be put on my property. Where are the justice in Oakland? Well, obviously, I, I, this is the first time I'm hearing of you in your case, but we will definitely follow up and at least look into what's taking place. It sounds like it's very unfair and unjust, but we have to uh, talk to the city. I am, you know, what you just described is, is horrible and horrendous. So thank you for sharing that. But uh, I'm sorry you're going through this, but we definitely will make some calls for you. Uh, my name is John Williams. Michael. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> my name is John Williams. John Williams. Uh, John Williams. Um, I, I've been an um, IC nurse for 20 years. I was the mayor of the rural of Kentucky. Um, I was diagnosed with AIDS, so now I can't work in the IC. I just want to tell you I appreciate all that you've done, people with living with AIDS, HIV, and I want to know um, what you're doing to continue to help people with HIV. Well, we're trying, and you look great. Thank you very much for being here. You know, you, we're trying to make sure Ryan White, the people don't fall through the cracks as it relates to Affordable Care Act and the um, HIV AIDS patients are integrated into the Affordable Care Act. Oh, Ryan White is preserved. There are no gaps there. But also, we're working, and the President's really good on this issue, with our national AIDS strategy to try to fully fund an HIV AIDS strategy that leads to an AIDS-free generation, which means more resources, more targeted resources into care, prevention, treatment. We're working on you know, vaccine research and all of the, you know, the pieces. Uh, so we're, it's an uphill battle, but I think we're holding the line on the Congress to really see this as a national priority. So it's good to see you. Thank you for coming. Okay, we're back downstairs now. Right, right here. This, oh, okay. Excuse me. Susan Jamerson, and I appreciate these comments here and issues brought forth. I wanted to know as a constituent if I was interested in helping to volunteer with your office. How Talk to Catherine afterwards, okay, right right here. Anybody who want to volunteer, let me tell you, volunteers, interns, people who uh, want to do some work in public service, we, we welcome you because we have an overwhelming number of cases, and as you hear today, people who need help, and that's what my office is all about, trying to help people weed through the federal bureaucracy and just live their daily lives in a way that they so deserve. So thank you very much again. Okay, right here, but then we're going to have to get back downstairs now. Right She's back. I see you. Okay. Uh, four generation Oakland flat under born raised 61st in San Francisco. So welcome to the kind of man who served 25 years or whatever. The inclusiveness of Oakland, I think, has really been powerful. So all of these questions of the individuals have been asking are based on what Mr. Obama had spoken about the inequalities and their endemic. I mean, they're endemic. They, they've just taken and the, the source. I mean, you said you know Shirley Chisholm, unbossed and unbought. That is not the description of our uh, government but personnel today. There's no doubt about that. The highest offices. Uh, question. Certainly know the, the man's mind better than most of us do. How did a person who speak, who spoke with such hope and um, change and income inequality, even come up with the concept of people? And it's, I mean, it's the base of all of them come up back down there. Well, I don't, yeah. I mean, what is right. that? Talk about uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the trade yeah, policy. It's not just a little, little yeah. trade thing on the side. This is <laughs> mine. Yeah, it is. And there's some of us who just disagree with the White House on these trade policies. And I think, you know, I don't, I don't believe the president right now on TPP um, has taken a hardcore position. And I think the way to, to see, it's coming from his administration, yes, but Congress, we still are weighing in on this, okay? And the implications and, are back here. Yes. It's not just something. No, I know. I, I, I am totally against it. So it's hard for me to explain any other person's motives behind it, except they think 
that this is going to uh, help with the trade balance and the deficit and increase exports more, exports from the United States create more jobs. I mean, you know, the whole trade jing lingo. That's what their thinking is. But having said that, it's still early. We're still fighting against it, and hopefully we'll win. And let me also, she mentioned Shirley Chisholm, who was my mentor and got me involved in politics, who um, was the first African-American woman for president. Well, since Shirley died several years ago, I've been working with the Postal Service to try to get us uh, a postal stamp honoring Shirley Chisholm. Well, we finally won that battle, so in January, we're going to have the Shirley Chisholm forever stamp, and we'll be rolling it out next time. So thank you for reminding us of this great one. Ms. Barbara Lee, thank you so very much for inviting me to come. My name is Shirley Young, and I am a resident of Oakland. And there is a different type of problem that is happening in Oakland. Um, it's a lot of people that are out of work. And the people that are out of work are targeting people that have worked. And they are, you know, creating jobs for themselves in a different type of way. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> you won't believe what is happening. They have uh, targeted me. They went under my house, cut my wires, and unplugged my heater, you know, and so that they can have a job. Year after year, they do something. You know, to make them a job. And when you go to the police department, you don't get the kind of help that you need. So, you know, it's time for some organization. You know, you have to take around sometimes in your own hands, you know. And it's bad. It's really, really bad because we need help. We don't have anyone we can go to. You go to the police department, you can't get help that you need. And it's people, it's ordinary people that lives in the community just like you are that, you know, they see you have work, and then they feel like you have uh, something going on. So when you leave, then they target your house. They go in, they do what they want to do, they take what they want. And it's bad. And so, you know, it's coming to the point now that you're going to have to handle matters yourself in the best way you know how. Do voting, do I have to, you know, you know, call the NAACP in? You know, it's a lot of things that you have to do. Well, let me just say, we have to raise the level of our activism in this community. Throughout my congressional yeah. we have to wake up a little bit and get more active and organized. Well, that's, that's what we have. True. We only have time for one more question right here, uh, because what time is it now? It's after 12, yeah. and we're going to have to uh, close down. But we have cards for you to leave questions, and staff will be around, and I really appreciate you staying so we can get as many of the questions out as we can. Okay, Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. And thank you for coming. What I have, I would like to share on your disaster phone call that I had uh, this last summer. My phone rang, private number, and I thought it was one of my daughters. I answered, and uh, I recognized a foreign voice who stated, you are on social security, and you have automatic banking. This is the Department of Social Security we need to confirm your social security number and your bank. And I immediately said, you have reached the police department. I'll be done. And I'll connect you with my captain, Clang. Of course, I could, you know, I have, I tried to retrieve the number and I couldn't get it. So I immediately called my bank. And you no, know, there was. I, you know, simply gave my bank account and so on to my bank, and no action had been taken. But this is what okay, I want. Okay, scams are taking things. place. People's privacy rights are being violated, and be very careful on any of these calls because there are scam operators out there and hackers uh, who are hacking into a lot of personal information. Let us know, and we'll see what happens. Listen, let me thank all of you for coming out. Thank you for staying. Really appreciate it.